So welcome everybody. We're going to talk about Horizon Cloud um, and we'll talk about some of the fundamentals about it. Um, by all means, do ask questions in the uh, Q&A um, and we'll answer them as we go along. Um, as always, um, we're going to start off with a little bit of survey because I want to sort of get a feel for what um, people know or necessarily may not know um, to get uh, an idea of sort of your experience with um, Horizon uh, Cloud and Horizon on-prem. So it gives me an idea of sort of where people are at with those things. So we'll take a few seconds for that, if you can quickly answer those. Well, good to know. Most people aren't using Horizon Cloud. And our second one, I suspect a lot of people might be doing this. Right, horizon on premise, or traditional horizon, as they sometimes call it, kind of thing. All right. So, again, we'll just take a few minutes for that. Ah. It's about 50-50 on that one. Interesting. Okay. All right. So um, it's a good thing to, to sort of see where people are at with Horizon Cloud. Um, and um, we'll take a look at what Horizon Cloud has to offer. I think I might. I even have some slides about what Horizon Cloud on Azure is um, and generally give us some ideas a little further, plus a live demo. Uh, kind of thing. So let's take a look at what is Horizon Cloud. Horizon Cloud is basically a control plane, right? So um, for those of us who've done virtual desktop infrastructure, right, you've done Citrix or whatever, deploy it locally, and you may have multiple sites, and you have to manage them independent of each other. That can be a challenge, right? Especially if you're a large organization, um, or even if you're not large, but you just spread out a lot. That can be challenging. And so what Horizon Cloud gives us is this ability to um, manage all of our horizon from the cloud itself, right? It's actually built for that purpose. Um, we can leverage things like um, even our on-premise deployments, right? So I can run Horizon on top of vSphere my local data center, I could run it on top of AWS, I could run it on top of AVS, which is Azure VMware Services, I could run it on top of Google Engine, you know, insert your favorite cloud platform here. But that's all traditional Horizon, and usually you'll need a Horizon Cloud Connector for it. Right? Horizon um, uh, Cloud on Azure is a little bit different in that we leverage the API of Azure itself, so I actually don't have to deploy out a connection server that's deployed out as part of my environment build. And I can show you what that looks like because uh, it is different than all the other ones. All the other ones, it's Horizon on-prem with a Horizon Cloud connector, that's it. Uh, but everything's managed through the same interface. I could manage all of them through the same interface um, within the environment. And that is one of the huge pluses. It makes things a lot easier for me to be able to do what I need to do to provide desktops to my end users. And that can be really important, especially in this day and age where we're seeing a lot more work from home becoming an actual thing. Uh, work from home is not a new concept. It's been around since the 90s. But we're finally at a stage where we can actually make it viable and easy to manage. And that is a huge plus um, for our customers, which would be our actual end users themselves, right? Um, and uh, this is continually being updated, which means that new features are coming in on almost a daily basis. And that's a huge thing um, within the environment. Oops. So there are a few pitfalls that do exist um, within um, what we have for Horizon Cloud. And there is one, there's a couple that remain, it doesn't matter whether you're doing traditional Horizon or you're doing Horizon Cloud on Azure or you know whatever. These two here are true across 
the board, right? So the biggest one is use case definition workload. That is people get excited. Oh, I'm going to do VDI. Everyone's going to have a VM. You will have a VM. You'll have a VM. Those will be your desktops. And then we forget that Windows 10 was not designed to be a virtual machine. It was designed to run as a tablet on Surface Pro. And so we create these use cases, right? We define the way that our users are going to use the resources we give them. So those resources are commonly, excuse me, the operating system and the applications, right? They're tools that the organization provides to them. And we view that as the same way we'd view a single desktop, a single physical desktop. We don't remember that now we're gonna take that desktop, we're gonna put it into a shared environment, which is what any hypervisor is. And we're gonna expect everything to work the same way. It doesn't. Right? So one of the big things with this is we should define what are what we refer to as use case definitions or workloads. Um, there are three main ones, which is a task worker concept. So you can think of um, users that have repeated tasks that they do throughout the day. Usually this is shift work. You can think of it like call center, um, front desk reception at a hotel, bank teller, these types of roles. It's a lot of data entry usually. So we usually label those as task workers, right? They do very low usage on CPU, low usage on frame rate, those types of things. Then we have our knowledge worker, which is the average worker um, kind of thing. Usually you have more flexibility about their times. So if they want to come in at, at eight and work till nine o'clock at night, hey, sure. Um, and they usually have more applications and it's usually more static 2D, some 3D, you know, a lot of Zoom these days um kind of thing and of course our last one which is our power users and that usually is divided into two types right cpu heavy power users so it teams fit into that category as do software developers and then on the other side of it is graphics heavy um, power users so these are marketing teams and video the team that supported me today right av types um and so if we didn't define what our use cases and workloads were then we'd miss out and potentially not develop a desktop that would be able to support them. That leads us into the next point, which is performance. Performance still remains one of our big, common top 10 for anything in Horizon. Um, and that's where we don't optimize the actual image, right? Windows by default, yeah, um, it does a lot of things. It's based mostly for a consumer market. So it does a weekly defrag, it does this, it does that, all of this stuff in the background. That type of stuff can actually impact a virtual desktop by making it slower. Um, and it adds up when you have, you know, a thousand of them or 10,000 of them, that can have a huge impact on the end user experience. And that is a big, you know, important part kind of thing. So there are a whole variety of ways to optimize. We often want to return off any services that we don't need, like Wi Fi. <laughs> Who needs Wi-Fi in a virtual machine? It's not necessary, right? Maybe I don't need sound on the virtual machine. I don't need a weekly defrag. I'll do that on my main image. So these types of things, regardless of what, you know, you're using to support your Horizon environment, so whether it's a traditional on-premise, whether it's Horizon running on top of your favorite cloud, or if it's running directly on Azure itself, these things have to be done regardless of it, right? It's really important. Now, Horizon Cloud on Azure has its own specific pitfalls, and these are the things that most customers tend to miss when setting up the environment. So the service principle, right, making sure that it's added into the appropriate role location on Azure itself. The decision about making a choice between using Azure or SDDC, a lot of people assume, oh, you only can choose one. Well, no, you can choose whichever one or all of them or one or two of them, right? The big thing about this is, is what you want to achieve from your VDI. And sometimes certain things make more sense on the Azure thing, uh, Azure platform um, for Horizon Cloud. I've seen some customers that use the Horizon Cloud on Azure for their call centers. It's easy to stand up. I can turn them off when they're not needed. I save money. Why not? Right? Um, others already have an existing SDDC and they want to continue using that, but now they want to leverage Horizon Cloud. Sure. Um, or some haven't decided either and they're investigating everything. That's good. Always investigate all the options and figure out which part of it will fit best for what your use cases or workloads are, right? 
um, I can do pretty much all of it on a Horizon Cloud on Azure if I wanted to, sure. Um, another thing, uh, networking is a big challenge. Well, it's, it's not a huge challenge, but it's often uh, a misconfiguration that we see a lot of. Uh, people forget to do peerings between the VNets. And for those of you that aren't familiar with Azure, VNets are like virtual switches on uh, vSphere, right? Um, so that can be a challenge. Um, so peering means connecting the multiple VNets together kind of idea. Misconfiguring DNS, that is an ongoing issue. That really should be on any of them. <laughs> um, a lot of people misconfigure their DNS. They don't have their FQDNs defined properly, those types of things. Um, there is an API limitation. We hit this in the class quite often. Um, right now, the current limit, best practice or limitation is one pod per Azure subscription. Um, in our class, we actually go well above that. Um, but it is something that we're waiting, you know, working with Microsoft to address. Uh, because of the way Horizon Cloud connects to Azure, it's actually leveraging directly the API that we find on Azure itself. So we're sort of limited by what its limitations are, right? And then quotas, that's a big one. A lot of people will do a proof of concept, they'll set up their environment, they'll have everything configured within the environment, and then they decide to make it production, right? So they'll do a proof of concept, they set that up, and they want to do production. So there's going from proof of concept to say 10,000 users. And they forget that the proof of concept probably used just the default quotas that Azure has. And so those have to be adjusted um, when you turn things into production because the limit is like 50 VMs, right? It's really small um, kind of thing. And so that's actually a big one, usually around the number of CPUs you can have, the VM families, as well as the number of IP addresses or static IPs in particular. For Horizon Cloud, um, where we're connected to an SDDC. So that's where we're running Horizon on top of either Horizon on-premise or Horizon on top of some other cloud. Um, in those cases, the biggest thing is the cloud connector itself in that um, people don't set it up, don't configure it correctly, et cetera. So those are our more common pitfalls that we find. Um, but as you guys, you know, as we go through it, you may have run into some other ones um, and you may have questions about them, by all means do ask um, about those. So some of our frequency asked questions, right? Why Horizon Cloud if I have Horizon on-prem? Um, this is actually one of the sort of, you know, more challenging things to sort of answer. Um, it really is Horizon on-prem, it'll be around for a little while, but if you really want to get the most out of your Horizon deployment, especially if you have multiple on-premise locations, uh, particularly if they're geographically located, there is a feature in Horizon Cloud that we don't really have in Horizon itself. And that is something called the universal broker. So on traditional Horizon, if I have multiple locations, I'll set up something called the cloud pod architecture, which allows me to connect those multiple locations together and my users can connect any desktop kind of thing. That requires me to set up all the load balancers, all the networking, all the DNS, all of that, and it can be very complex uh, design. With Horizon Cloud, and I, I can connect my on-premise to it, I can leverage Universal Broker, which is essentially a little more intelligent version of CloudPod architecture. So you can actually leverage and use a pre, you know, a created DNS address that VMware looks after. We look after the global load balancing. We do take care of the geolocation all of that, the only thing you have to do is connect your pods and do the universal broker assignment. That's it. It makes things a lot easier um, for an environment. So that's one of the big pluses with it. Um, and, you know, there's nothing saying that you have to give up your on-prem to leverage Horizon Cloud. This just makes it easier to manage your on-premise locations, particularly if you have more than one. If you have one, hmm, I could see where Horizon Cloud may not necessarily be benefit, but really going forward for any environment that's gonna have more than one, you're really gonna see a benefit out of this. Which cloud or what is the best cloud to use with Horizon Cloud? <laughs> any of them, really when it comes down to it. 
Because the best answer to that is what does serve your needs, right? Um, the, um, when it comes to the different clouds, right? So we have AWS, we have uh, Azure VMware Services, Google Cloud Engine, um, Dell Cloud, and there's a few others I can't remember off the top of my head. But all of those are all fair game, right? If you have agreements with them and you're running Horizon on top of them, sure, they're great for what they want. If you're not running those, or if you want to take advantage of what Azure provides, then you could use that one. So this is a kind of, it depends on your situation, but they're all the best cloud to use with Horizon Cloud. It is open to all of them. The only difference is for those that run traditional Horizon on top of the cloud, that would be treated like Horizon SDDC. Horizon Cloud on Microsoft Azure is the only one that's different because in that case, we build out what would be the connection servers. We build out our load balancers and we build out all the pieces for it. You don't have to build that. So it actually talks directly to the Azure API and the only parts that you as administrator build out then are your desktops and RDSH and your app volumes, right? So it makes things a little bit better. And of course that leads to, well, on-prem or versus cloud. There's no versus. It's more about, again, what fits your needs and what you are doing within your environment and what your workloads are like. When it comes down to it, right? Certain things make a lot of sense to run on Horizon Cloud, um, you know, or to run on a cloud in general. I think everything that's happened over the last couple of years have highlighted that really having everything on premise isn't always the best option when it comes to desktops and actually having some cloud options can be beneficial, right? Um, I've seen a lot of um, organizations that rush to use Horizon Cloud on Azure because it allowed them to spin up desktops really fast, only pay for them when they're in use and shut them down when they're not in use. And these can be geolocated to wherever they are in the world. So if an employee had to go back home or had to be somewhere else and they're stuck there, this could be used for it. And that's one of the big benefits out of it. Horizon Cloud will support all of that um, with one interface, right? Huge plus. All right. Um, so uh, when you get the PDF of this, it has a whole bunch of resources, including I actually have a nuts and bolts session um, that's going to be October 6th um, that will basically walk through um, a variety of things. Now, before we get to all of these, let me bring up my demo so I can show you. This is Horizon Cloud. This is the one that I'm using right now. It's an actual, this is a live production environment. Um, and one of the things I mentioned was universal brokers, one of the big benefits where you can leverage the VMware provided address or you can put your own in if you wanted to, right? So you can provide your own FQDN, put, upload a certificate, put in the password for a certificate, um, your choice. Um, I don't want to go through certificates, so I use the from a provided one. Um, I can do two-factor authentication, which either can be Radius or RSA Secure ID, and I can do some client settings within the environment. And it literally is that. It takes me less than a minute to set up my universal broker. Now, it'll take 30 minutes for it to settle everything down, but once it's ready, I can connect in um, within the environment. Let me open up a new window here. So I've actually built some backend pieces. Uh, oh, I got to remember what my address was. That's this one. Now I'm in Halifax. Oh, I don't have any tenements for a user. Oh, uh, I had some. Oh, oh user 20, that'd be why.
So I can use my browser to log in, get to my resources, right? I'm in Halifax. This actual deployment's in the West US, so it puts it somewhere in Redmond, um, somewhere on the West Coast of the US. It doesn't matter where I am. I could be anywhere and I can get this. And the Universal Broker will take care of all of the geolocation load balancing. If I had more than one location, so I have everything right now is in West US, but if I had locations around the world, I could be anywhere in the world and access a resource from anywhere. It'll take care of balancing that out within the environment. So when I do an assignment like this one here, for example, and this is showing you the Azure side of it, it'd be the exact same thing if I was doing it um, with um, SDDC based Horizon, but I can select all of my pods. Now, the only thing you have to keep in mind for the assignments is, is that all the pods you select must be the same kind of pod, either Azure base pods or Horizon SDDC. Now the Horizon SDDC could be on anything. It could be cloud, on-premise, that's fine, right? Um, I could restrict them to one site if I wanted to, right? Choose whichever site, nearest site or home site, or just do anything, which means in the floating assignment, we get to any desktop we want, which is really nice. And I think, so a huge benefit. This is an easy interface to utilize within the environment. I can see my capacity in my two pods that I have um, in Palo Alto, right? These are actual virtual machines that are running on Azure itself. And it will build out, um, in the case of Azure, it's special because it builds out two sets of uh, universal access gateways, builds a set that's quote unquote internal, which would be from your express route or your VPN and NPLS. Um, on-site to Azure, or external UEGs, which are meant for from the internet to Azure kind of thing. And so it builds all of that out here. Here are my virtual machines that got built out as part of it. And there's my node. We would call these similar to connection servers for on-premise. And if you notice, they're a little bit different here. They're Linux, which is very different than traditional ones um, on the environment. So nice benefit out of it and that I, as a IT admin, don't have to build any of this out. Right. Any questions so far? You guys are a quiet group. Not seeing any questions as of yet. Okay, let's see here. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna go to a second set because I saw a lot of people were sort of new to all of this. And I'll start from here. It looks similar to what we saw, right? So as I said, Horizon Cloud on Azure is a little bit different. Many, most of you seem to do Horizon on-premises, seem to be a little bit more than 50% were Horizon on-premise. So Horizon Cloud, oh, um, an anonymous question came through for panelists chat. Can I use Horizon Cloud for DR scenarios? Yes, actually. It's actually one of the big um, pluses for um, Horizon Cloud. And this is, I've seen a lot of customers who are starting to use Horizon Cloud for a DR type scenario. One of the things we can do, let me go into that pool that we have here. This is a floating pool, right? So that means users, can um, log into it, they get whatever desktop happens to be available, right? Now, Horizon Cloud on Azure creates full virtual machines. The only thing it doesn't do is instant clones, and that's just because the API does not allow for it. Um, but we are working on a new cloning technology at some point, I don't know when or if that will happen. So I can create all my VMs, I can change the size of it, um, I can choose which OUs it goes into. I can optimize performance. And this is the interesting part, right? Power management. So I can either optimize performance, optimize power or balance. And so what this does is by default behavior, the pool will either, you know, on certain hard coded values, it'll either leave most of the VMs on, most of them off, or it'll find a happy medium between the two um, based on usage. So as more people use it, it starts powering on more systems. But I can also put in a power management option. 
So this means that I can say, you know what, at, at all other times, leave it at zero. Um, from midnight to or just basically I'll just say all day, right? Always have one desktop available. So that allows me um, kind of thing. And so this allows me then to shut all my VMs off. I can power them on when I need to. Um, I'm currently running Horizon on-prem. I have both AWS and Azure accounts. I'm needing to upgrade uh, vSphere. It might make sense to simply by moving Horizon to cloud to pull that piece out of the mix. Which cloud is preferred? Does this sound like a viable migration upgrade path? So I'll answer the upgrade piece. Um, it actually would make a, a good upgrade path option. Um, you could run Horizon on, on AWS. You could split the load, right? So depending upon the type of desktops that you have in the sense of your use cases, right? So if you have a bunch of, you know, task worker type of, of load, it's low usage type of desktops, um, average desktops, everybody uses has a standardized image. Um, I would stick those on Azure. The big benefit with Azure is you only pay for what's powered on. And this power savings option is really good. It can cut that cost down significantly. Task workers tend to be the biggest chunk of desktops that we have. Um, on the other side of it, the AWS will allow you to leverage the instant clone concept. Um, and for your average workers or even your knowledge workers or no, oh, your knowledge work is uh, your power users. Sorry, your power users actually may benefit from the Azure piece as well. Um, either way, knowledge workers and engineers. Okay, so knowledge workers actually could put them all onto Azure. Um, so you can actually provision out. Let me go under inventory, imported VMs, import. So you can actually, my subscription doesn't allow me to do, to do this. <laughs> I, we deliberately put this the restriction in, but you can actually include a GPU. So you could build, um, and this is what I tend to tell most people, is build an RDSH that's backed by the video, um, use a um, publish application option to share out the applications that your engineers um, or video power users need kind of thing and give everyone a generic desktop for everything else, right? So that's, you know, their email, their office tools, that type of stuff. Um, and you can then also leverage a power savings here, which will help cut down on costs. So when users aren't using it, we shut down the systems um, and leverage floating. But this could allow you to at least migrate your users off the on-premise. You want to upgrade it, then you could upgrade that if you want to bring some back and then leverage the Azure as a DR or just as a temporary, you know, move things around so users always have something to use kind of thing. You could do something like that. So long-winded way, yes, this is a viable way to either migrate or upgrade um, kind of thing. Just need to plan out um, when you're gonna move users and make sure they know, you know, identify the desktops that they're going to move to and make sure their stuff, right? Their profiles, their documents, all of that stuff is backed up and replicated somewhere. Um, within the environment. So hopefully that helps, Dan, um, and gives you some ideas. All right. So we can leverage GPUs. There's nothing saying that we can't. And it's a very common scenario to build out a farm that is GPU backed and share it out as an application or to share it out as a desktop, depending upon, again, your use case and um, scenario type thing. Um, it's fairly common to put the GPUs on the farm itself. I can build a farm, and we sort of saw that. Um, wait for it to, to get everything, because it's checking out what version of my, uh, my connection servers are. But I can build a farm using Windows 10 multi-session if I want to, right? So there's my enterprise, there's my multi-session, including with Office 365 Pro already built in. Um, Windows 7, you can only run Windows 7 on Azure. This is good for those environments that maybe have legacy applications and you want to leverage this, right? Or the traditional Windows Server options um, with it. Now, I can leverage, say, this one, do a domain join, put in my credentials that I want, give it a name, and then under here, these are all 
what we see for traditional horizon, the horizon feature sets that we get um, within the environment. So I can pick and choose what feature sets I want. This will help me build my imported VM. Imported VMs are like your gold primary pristine image kind of thing. Once it's imported in, I make sure the agent is active. And then once that's active, I can then publish it um, as a standalone image, which means it's published to my specific pod if I want to. Put in my user, and my super secret passwords. And so when it becomes an image, we can think of it like a template that we use in vSphere, same concept, right? It's a powered off VM. We use this from which to build the rest of everything right? um, within the environment. If maybe I have an agent that's out of date, oh, this one here, right? The little blue dot tells me the agent's out of date. I can update my agents. It's really easy. It actually automates the process for us. So one of the big benefits of the Horizon Cloud is that it actually helps us build a true life cycle for desktops. It actually goes through that process of it um, within the environment. And so I could manage um, my environment. Do I have to use Horizon Cloud? No, you don't have to use Horizon Cloud. You can use Horizon itself um, within the environment. I mean, if you have a small location, maybe you have 100 users, you could use Horizon on-prem. But if you're going to be over multiple locations, geographical distances, um, one of the challenges that we're starting to see with work from home, right? People are like excited. Oh, I'm going to buy my dream house out in the middle of nowhere. And they forget out in the middle of nowhere also means crappy internet. <laughs> this has become a new challenge um, within environments so that end users end up in places that don't have the best internet. Dial-up still exists. So that can be one of the, the big challenges um, for that. Using Horizon Cloud on Azure in particular means I let, have to worry about that a lot less because Azure does have data centers everywhere. And so the locality of how close this is to where end users are, this is the other big benefit. It's I don't have to build that small little Horizon deployment you know, out here, I can actually bring, you know, I can manage everything from a location and it can be close to the user in essence without me having to build a full data center um, within the environment. So it's, yeah, don't have to do, don't have to use Horizon Cloud, but there is a huge benefit out of it um, within the environment. So if I want to bring in my environment, I can choose Azure or I can choose SDDC. So here, it will bring me my download for my cloud connector and I can attach them in. As you can see, the cloud connector isn't concerned about which platform you're running on top of. It's concerned about whether it can talk to Horizon. Right? And you can think of the cloud connector as a tunnel between your pod and Horizon Cloud itself. And so we can bring that in. If I had some cloud connectors, I could bring in my own premise pods um, within the environment. Right? For Azure, I just need to have the appropriate information. I can bring in additional Azure pods into the environment. Um, Horizon Cloud itself has, I haven't seen any limit as of right now for the number of pods that you can bring into your Horizon Cloud deployment. Um, the only limit that I've seen is around um, uh, Horizon Cloud on Azure, and that is each pod can have no more than 2000 concurrent connections, and you can only have really one pod per subscription, right? And that's due to API challenges from uh, Azure itself. So. There is no limit. I can have all the subscriptions I want, right? Azure is not going to say no to taking money. <laughs> you want to pay? Sure, right? Remember with Azure, you're only paying for what you're actually using. That is powered on virtual machines. So, you know, pay a little bit for storage, but really the bulk of the charges do come, probably about 95 to 98% come from your powered on VMs. And because this actually has a built-in feature where you can actually control when they're powered on, big benefit out of it. So let me switch back to slides for a second here. All right, low cost hourly billing. This is what we're referring to, right? Single infrastructure provider, true multi-cloud deployments. And it is true multi-cloud deployments um, within the environment. So <clears throat> where is the responsibility? This is the other benefit of Horizon Cloud on Azure. 
normally if you do an on-premise, you have to take care of the hardware. You have to look after the storage. You have to look after the servers. You have to look after the hypervisor, all of that. You don't have to with Horizon Cloud on Azure. With Horizon Cloud on Azure, Microsoft's responsible for that. VMware is responsible for the control plane and any of the objects we build. So that includes the nodes themselves, the unified access gateway, the load balancers we build, the network security groups we build, the resource groups, all of that. The only part that you as an administrator are responsible for is this, the things you build, right? Your Windows 10, your Windows 7, your Windows 2000, your RDSH hosts. That's the only part that you as an administrator will have to trouble look after. The rest of it is either VMware or Azure, right? So from an IT support perspective, a lot of things get reduced significantly as a result of this. And that's a huge plus, right? Um, <laughs> I got asked by someone in support, can you give us an easy way to do the install? We've looked at the documentation. It's 900 pages long and we don't know where to start. I was like, okay, well, let me see if I can figure this out. And so I made this um, chart, if you will. Basically, there's certain information that you must have. Um, to do a deployment with um, uh, Horizon Cloud and Azure. You need a subscription and any info related to it. So that includes your Horizon Cloud subscription, have to have that. You need your DNS, FQDN information, and then the Azure subscription info. So the actual Azure subscription ID, your um, uh, the actual region it's in, directory ID, that type of stuff then we need to have our supporting Azure components, right? So your Active Directory choice, you actually can deploy your Horizon Cloud on Azure with six different ways of deploying out Active Directory. And really it comes down to three choices, a couple of ways for each of them. Traditional Active Directory, right? Deployed in a virtual machine, there's your Active Directory. Um, Azure Active Directory with directory services or Azure Active Directory with, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Azure Active Directory domain services connecting to a traditional Active Directory or Azure Active Directory services with domain services by itself. That's really what it comes down to. So you can choose any one of those for your Active Directory choice. It does have full trust all the way through. Um, we need to set up our resource providers. That's on the Microsoft Azure. So things like storage, networking, we wanna be able to enable those. You also need PostgreSQL and SQL enabled as well. A service principle. Service principle is an object in Azure that we use to talk to the Azure API. That has to be created and it has to be given appropriate permissions in the subscription. And then the VNets. The VNets are the virtual switches. So we'll make sure that we have appropriate virtual switches and subnets for the whole environment set up and configured accordingly. Okay. And then with that information, we go to deploy our node. So we put in our info that we need for actually deploying it out. When that happens and you fill that all information, you hit the you know, create button, it will go and create what's known as a jump box. The jump box is a temporary box. It will go and download the other pieces it needs, the UAGs, et cetera, and configure those for you. This process from start to finish takes about 70 minutes. Right? You only do it once though, kind of thing. Once it's finished that, you put in the information to actually join it to the domain. So what we call a domain bind. Um, that's to connect the uh, pod itself to Active Directory and then domain join. That would be used when you create your images and create your um, BDI deployments, right? So your actual desktops and your farms and so on. Then you do your broker choice. The broker choice is actually one of two, the universal broker, like I showed, as well as what's called single site. So if you're only ever going to build one site, that's fine. Um, there is a path now in place to actually upgrade from single site to universal broker, right? And then you go and build your stuff, right? Build your farms, build your VDI, all of that kind of fun stuff. So you can actually have something for your end users to use. That's essentially how you build it. It's really easy, actually. So getting started, you need these things. And this is the actual steps. And we actually go through this. If you take our class, we'll actually build the whole thing. Um, within the environment. That's the architecture, that's what sort of looks like um, within the environment. So you have the horizon control plane, you have the Azure hypervisor, and you have the optional on-premise. You can do them all at the same time if you wanted to, right? 
um, there is also App Volumes Cloud. And App Volumes Cloud is the same or very similar to App Volumes 4. But the difference is, is I build it here. And I can actually manage my apps through here. So I can build additional ones. And this one here is in the process of being built. Um, I got a question. Let's see here. Would Horizon Cloud on Azure be a good choice for work from home deployments? Are there any considerations that IT teams should make for work for home deployments? So it would be an excellent choice for work from home. Um, you know, as I said, the benefit of, you know, being able to choose when VMs are powered on or powered off, having that power management option um, is good. You can deploy, you know, um, deploy, you can deploy the environment um, easily in the background without having any impact on users that are using um, desktops. Uh, it is a full virtual machine um, option. Um, the only consideration that I suggest for IT teams to really be aware of is um, what I was alluding to um, earlier, which is the um, you know, users that are really remote. Uh, that's the only thing you have to watch for, right? Um, no matter, you know, Azure is excellent as is Horizon Cloud, but if they're trying to access it with, you know, 64 baud modem, there's only so much optimization that you can do on any platform to make it work with them. So that's the one thing to sort of consider for the environment, right? But it is a really good choice. Doesn't VMware have a Horizon on Azure solution now? Ah, AVS is a little bit different than Horizon on Azure. So Horizon on Azure talks directly to the API. AVS, however, is like AWS. Basically, this is leveraging uh, Azure's hardware, bare metal, there's an install of vSphere on top of it, and I would install Horizon on top of that. So that would be like traditional Horizon, but running on top of um, uh, vSphere on top of Azure hardware, right? That's different. There, I'm still connecting to the vSphere API. Horizon Cloud on Azure is talking directly to Azure's API. So it's a slight difference. So with the VMware's um, Horizon on AVS, I as an administrator am still responsible for the Horizon deployment. That is the connection servers. They're still installed on Windows systems. I'm responsible for the UAGs. I'm responsible for the networking that has to be configured and so on. So there's a lot, I still have a lot more responsibility. Yes, the bare metal and the nodes that are built are uh, Azure's, but anything I build on top of those, is mine responsibility. So I have a little more responsibility as an IT administrator um, kind of thing. It's similar to AWS um, kind of thing. Does that answer the question, John? Excellent, right. So it's not that it's bad, it's a different way of doing it. <laughs> um, they do have, you know, you can look on their website kind of thing, um, but it has the same concept this always happens. I don't know why they put that in there. <laughs> Every time I go to that link, I keep forgetting that they have this. Uh, on Azure, where is... Let's try AVS, see if they'll actually have... If you do a search on Azure's website, they keep moving things and I don't know where they stack it. Um, but the minimum is similar to what you see on AWS. It's like three um, ESXi hosts is the minimum requirement, right? And they do have, you know, pay as you go, as well as one year, two year and three year plans. So um, definitely an option kind of thing. All right. So let's see here. Um, so this would be the things that you would need at the beginning, as I mentioned, the external gateways. Um, you must have, it used to be that you had to have a UAG. They've since removed that restriction. So now I can choose which UAG sets I want, if I want any um, within the environment. And updating the pods is really nice because here's the nice thing about it. Um, the update maintenance window is about 
mm, seven to 10 minutes for end users. Um, so that's the most amount of time that they will be without using a desktop on a particular pod um, kind of thing. The way it works is this, when a pod needs to be updated, we make a full copy of the deployment. That is, we copy out the number of, of um, connection servers, we copy out the UAGs, we set all of that up. Once that's up, the actual maintenance window occurs where we stop access to what's referred to here as the blue node, which is the active node. We copy all the information over to the new one, which is the green node. And then once that's copied, we bring that up and delete the old one. What's nice about this is VMware support will be with you through that whole time. If anything happens, we fail back to the blue node and we figure out what's missing. Before you even begin the update, we will check your environment to, to as much as we can. So we'll check that DNS is working okay. We'll check that you have you know, the uh, necessary permissions. We'll check that, you know, are you at a certain percentage on your quotas, et cetera. And if anything looks like it might cause a failure, we will try and we'll be proactive about it and notify you, hey, you wanna do an update, but we've noticed that there are some challenges. You need to fix these before the update date or reschedule the update date for another time. Because we're with you as part of this upgrade, right? that hopefully will mean less problems, but can also help you be able to address things within the environment.